hey loves welcome or welcome back to my channel if you are new here my name is faith so guys today i'll be checking out the reasons why europe is falling behind the united states and i'm super excited as always if you are yet to subscribe to this channel please consider subscribing give this video a massive thumbs up comment share and all that good stuff and without much ado let's see what this video is all about europe is in decline europe is in crisis europe is falling behind the united states and china you've heard those sentences a thousand times whether it be on the news or on youtube channels they say that europe is becoming economically irrelevant and this graph of gdp per capita compared to the us seems to confirm it we see this clear divergence since 1995 however then come the simplistic explanations like an aging population the absence of tech giants and supposedly lazy europeans and those explanations are mostly myths, especially when you consider that some European countries have managed to power forward. So what are the real explanations for Europe's economic decline, and is Europe actually already close to solving its problem? This video was made possible by Into Europe's Patreon supporters, and I want to give a shout out to The Daily Upside for partnering with us on this video. Check out the link in the description to sign up to their free business newsletter. To answer these questions, we need to understand how we got here, because in the 1990s, Europe was seen as an unstoppable economic force, with people writing about a coming economic clash between the United States and the European Union. The starting point of this is this chart of gross domestic product, or GDP, which measures economic outputs. While Europe's GDP has grown continuously over the past decades, other countries grew faster, leading to a relative decline for Europe and a fall of Europe's share of global GDP. But just looking at this one number won't tell us the full story. Of course. GDP measures the total income earned in an economy. Looking at it like this, total income can be measured as the number of people that worked, how many hours they worked, and how productive they have been. By breaking it down, we can understand why the EU has historically had a lower GDP than the United States. The reason for that is that European workers tend to work 15 to 25% fewer hours than their American counterparts, thus producing less output. That's it also allows us to understand why the US over the past century has grown faster than Europe. With more population growth from immigration and a higher birth rate, the United States had more additional workers to grow its economy. Yet, at the same time, Europe compensated for this by being a productivity champion since that in 1995, if Europeans worked the same amount of hours as Americans, several Western and Northern European countries would actually have had GDPs per capita that are higher than that of the US. This choice to work fewer hours is a conscious one by Europeans and their governments, which allows for better quality of life at the expense of GDP. But let's not stray too far from the topic of this video. So back to the GDP difference between Europe and the United States. While hours worked and numbers of workers explain most of Europe's relatively smaller GDP compared to the United States up until the 1990s, it's not what has both economists and politicians most worried. Instead, their concern is on Europe's lost productivity edge on the United States. Before I get into that, I want to talk about today's sponsor, The Daily Upside. If you have a hard time finding reliable news covering what's unfolding across the global economy, The Daily Upside might be your solution. The Daily Upside is a free business newsletter that was founded by a team of investment bankers, scholars, and journalists, with the sole purpose of contextualizing the news against the thematic undercurrents shaping the broader business climate. Every morning, The Daily Upside sends you a morning brief followed by more detailed stories across tech, finance, and investing. It's become something that I read in the morning as it offers concise yet insightful pieces that help me prepare for videos like this one. As of recording this video last week, they published this piece on the world's largest ever 4-day workweek trial that was conducted in the UK. It turns out the vast majority of trial subjects favor permanent long weekends, with company revenue remaining effectively unchanged and actually increasing 1.4%. As someone who looks to deliver analytical, insightful, and unbiased news, I can't recommend The Daily Upside enough. Check out the link in the description to sign up to The Daily Upside for free. Now, back to the video. To find out what happened in Europe, I went to Brussels to interview one of Europe's most prominent economists, Maria Joao Rodriguez, a former minister for Portugal and MEP. For the past 25 years, she's worked on European competitiveness, and she actually wrote the EU's first strategy to deal with its greatest economic challenge. Back in the 1990s, as the EU started to notice some of the changes in the global economy, Europe was faced with two potential paths. We could 
either go to reducing wages or to go another way which would be to invest in creativity, innovation, education, to improve competitiveness. And that transformation in understanding was driven by one thing. It was fundamentally the digital revolution, I must say. In anticipation for this transition, the EU set out the Lisbon Strategy in 2000, which aimed to transform Europe into a knowledge economy. It aims to raise R&D spending to 3% of GDP, invest massively in digital infrastructure, and train a highly skilled workforce. The success of the countries that fully adopted it pointed to being the right strategy, but it and its successor program, Europe 2020, failed to be implemented by several European countries. When we start uh, launching the strategy, we had already a problem of lack of means, financial means, and the capacity really to, uh, to implement. A lot of Europe's economic trouble can be explained by its incomplete transition to a knowledge-based economy since 1995. In fact, according to this study by the University of Groningen, the US's impressive increases in productivity between 1995 and 2005 can largely be explained by the development of intellectual property and IT. In other words, the knowledge economy. The thing is, Europe started in a relatively bad position to adapt to this transition, and after going through a bunch of papers, studies and reports, I compiled the four main reasons. The first is simply that Europe was late to the digital transition, which started in Silicon Valley in California. This meant that the US simply had a head start, connecting schools, and could then build on that to innovate more, with many business leaders already being digital natives in the 1990s. The second reason that affected Europe's transition was the nature of its labor markets. Both high youth unemployment over the past two decades and the older population means that new ideas took longer to spread to Europe and its companies than it did in the United States. This was compounded by the fact that Europe has less economic competition than in the United States, in part as a result of economic fragmentation. This additional competition in the United States means that American firms are generally better managed than their European counterparts, as a result of survival of the fittest dynamics. These are forced to deploy new technologies better and faster than European firms, leading to more efficient use of resources and a higher productivity. This was further worsened by the continued fragmentation of the European market, particularly for services. In Europe, cross-border trade in services is about half the level of European trade in goods, as a result of both cross-border regulation and language barriers. This offers a competitive advantage to the homogenous US, which could quickly build tech champions at home that would then dominate the globe. This fragmentation and diminished competition means that European companies are much smaller than their American counterparts. And I'm not talking about GAFA-like tech behemoths. Small European firms make 60% of total employment versus 20% in the United States. These firms are usually less productive and less able to invest in new technologies like digitalization. And finally, perhaps one of the most important reasons for the past decade is the aftermath of both the 2008 financial crisis and the 2015 Eurozone crisis. During this period, we really missed the, the means. That's where Europe really started lagging behind clearly. Governments slashed R&D and education budgets and decreased overall investment as part of panic-driven austerity. This sunk innovation in tech created a bad investment climate for European companies in fact, it took 11 years for investment in Europe to recover to pre-financial crisis levels. The absence of investment for new emerging sectors meant that Europe continued to focus on more historical economic sectors, which had less room for revolutionary change or growth. So to summarize, Europe is a continent with a fragmented economy and an aging workforce that lagged behind on digitalization and innovation, due to austerity for the past two decades. It's actually possible to distinguish between four different categories of countries in Europe. And because I know you're dying to see how your country is done, here's a beautiful chart looking into the labor productivity and productivity growth over the past 20 years. First are the countries that are doing well, with Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland and Ireland, which are close to being on par with the United States when it comes to productivity growth. Then there is the low productivity, low productivity growth category, which is made up solely of Greece, which saw productivity collapse after a decade of intense austerity. Most of Europe over the past decades has belonged to the stagnating high productivity, low productivity growth category. This includes countries like France, Spain or Italy, but also countries which at first sight are performing well, like the Netherlands or Finland, and to a lesser extent Germany. Then there are the countries with low productivity and high growth like Poland or the Czech Republic, 
and other post-communist countries that have been catching up economically with the rest of Europe since they joined the European Union. So now we know why Europe underperformed and that this underperformance affected Europe much more broadly than we could have thought. So where does that leave Europe and can it catch up with the United States? Well, while most European countries fall under high productivity, low growth, dividing Europe geographically makes more sense if we're to look at the future of Europe. And these lines correspond roughly to Northern, Southern and Central and Eastern Europe and our special snowflake category, France. First, let's focus on the countries that face the biggest challenges, Southern Europe. Southern Europe, although a bit behind, was mostly keeping up with Northern Europe until 2008. Uh, when the financial crisis came, then these uh, differences between member states came much larger. As a result of bad demographics with some of the lowest birth rates in Europe, an exodus amongst young people and massive debts as a result of the financial crisis, these countries, particularly Italy and Greece, will struggle to invest and improve their productivity in the future. Then there's Central and Eastern Europe, which started from a low productivity base and saw record productivity growth over the past two decades as they caught up with the rest of Europe. While they don't share the debt problem of Southern Europe, terrible demographics, mostly due to immigration to Western and Northern Europe, will put constraints on their prospects in the coming decades. Then there is Northern Europe, which adopted relatively well to the knowledge-based economy and experienced little austerity during the financial crisis. They were able to keep investing in education, tech and digitalization. And these countries were also able to compensate somewhat for their bad demographics thanks to immigration from the rest of Europe, but also other parts of the world. And due to steady growth in the 2000s and 2010s, they have only limited debt, meaning they can invest more into the future. As a result, they're relatively well positioned. And the last category is made up solely of France. As a Frenchman, I'm hesitant to stroke the egos of the French further by giving them their own category, but they fit somewhere in between the poor performance of Southern Europe and the relatively good performance of Northern European countries. France has far healthier demographics than the average European country owing to a higher birth rate, but their debt being much higher than Northern Europe means they have more limited room for investment to correct course in the future. As you've noticed, there's one European country that I have not mentioned, and that is the United Kingdom, which despite having a solid tech industry, has had little productivity growth and little investment over the past three decades. In fact, as a result of Brexit, some have put the country in the Southern Europe category, economically speaking. So while Europe is down, there's actually some encouraging developments. During COVID, Europe learned from its mistakes and didn't go for austerity once again, instead of opting to invest billions into its economy. For Southern Europe, the COVID recovery package, Next Generation EU, is actually a Lisbon strategy package in disguise, but this time with a budget that could put them on track to catch up with Northern Europe. And the COVID pandemic provided shock therapy levels of digitalization to the lives of many Europeans. Even in tech, there are some good news for Europe, with the continent's startup ecosystem maturing along with funding opportunities for European companies, potentially opening the door to new economic sectors and revived productivity growth. Yet despite reasons for cautious optimism on the financing front, Europe faces several big challenges. It will face difficulty keeping its aging population skills up to level, and increased welfare and pension spending for an aging population will stretch already thinned out government budgets, particularly in Southern Europe, where high levels of debt make it harder to invest. Its tamed version of capitalism as opposed to the cutthroat capitalism in the US leads to less well-managed and thus less profitable and productive firms than in the United States. And more important still, the tendency to open the subsidy tap every time it feels it's falling behind means it isn't pushing for the structural reforms to its market or business culture that may guarantee its success in the future. But these are topics for other videos. But what do you think? Can Europe reform its economy? Will Eastern and Central Europe continue enjoying sky-high productivity growth? And are you interested in more stories about Europe's economic fortunes? That let me know in the comments down below. This video took quite some research and time to make. It involved a trip to Brussels, and in the future I'd like to make more videos like this one where I talk about the future and the challenges facing Europe. So if you feel more like you want to support this channel, and go check out the Interior Patreon to make sure I can produce more high quality explainer videos like this one into the future. Wow, you guys, that was such a long one, but I learned a lot and I want to throw it to the comment section. What do you guys think? Do you think that Europe economical situation is going to decline further or is going to climb up? Let me know in the comment section. This was such an insightful 
video and i learned a lot and i enjoyed every minute that it lasted if you guys totally enjoyed watching give this video a massive thumbs up comment share and all that good stuff and this is me officially signing out i'll see you guys in my next video bye guys